Hi, this is part two of our introduction to order flow webinar. Now all of the things that we've looked at so far is the flow of orders and that's order flow. And what we're going to look at now, I guess, could be termed as order flu or a look at where people are positioned right now. Now there's lots of people out there that discuss the long term use a volume profile looking at daily weekly monthly profiles FT 71 is probably the most famous uh, L2 ST have a lot of free material on volume profiling now we're not going to look at long-term volume profiling today um, but and also we're not going to go over the ground covered in our day trading without charts webinar we are going to look at some shorter term volume profiling theory and a few techniques you can use now the volume profile itself simply shows the quantity traded at each price for the current session. A volume cluster is simply an area, a small area, where an exceptional amount of volume traded. Now a volume cluster, it's not dissimilar to a high volume node on a long term volume profile, but the clusters are usually referring to action that occurs over a much shorter period of time. And I think it's important to distinguish between your approach for volume clusters and long term volume profile high volume areas because you're going to be approaching them in slightly different ways. One of the most common times you're going to see a volume cluster is at a swing high or a swing low. And by that I mean a major high and a low. Uh, on the ES, for instance, we have uh, 10 points up, 10 points down very often on days. So we'll actually be talking about a volume cluster at the low of the day or the high of the day before we turn around and put in a, a new intraday trend. A volume cluster at a major swing low is effectively absorption at the low. It's normally followed by a lot more contracts hitting the offer on the way up away from the area as buyers step in. And this is what a lot of people call responsive buying. As this is the area where buyers stepped in, the theory is that this area is going to be defended by those buyers. Now in practice, you can't rely on the market actually coming back and testing that area. The first leg up off the bottom on the ES is often 16 or so ticks. And those areas don't actually get retested that often when we put a major swing up off the low. On a smaller first move up, then yeah, you know, if we move up eight ticks off the low, then we're obviously a, more, a lot more likely to see a retest, a double bottom, that kind of thing. Now the volume cl cluster, most of the time, is not going to be visible on the price chart. Of course, you're going to see that the market turned around, but you're not going to see on the price chart that it turned around after printing high volume. Now the places that this is most visible are the volume profiles and the footprint charts. Cumulative delta itself isn't going to help you a lot in terms of seeing there's a volume cluster there. Now this is an area where we can have a reasonable expectation that the market will hold because of the positions held there. It's just a lower probability that will actually come back for a test. Now what's a higher probability is a volume cluster that's created midway through a move. And here we see an example where a volume cluster might be created midway through a move. It doesn't stop the market and the market carries on up. Now volume clusters must be exceptional volume and it's exceptional volume relative to what's printing that day. So if you see 10,000 contracts go off at a price and all level of the levels that day have traded 9,000 contracts, it's not significant. Now a cluster midway through a swing is usually and probably obviously accompanied by a pause because if an exceptional amount of volume is printing it's obviously going to take time for that to happen. So when you see a market move up then exceptional volume print and then carry on up you don't actually know why that happened. Now it could be a failed attempt by bears to hold the market down or it could just be one half of a large statard position being executed. Now if it was an attempt to hold by the bears then 
those people are not going to be look looking at building a short position again anytime soon. So if the bears tried to hold the market down at this point and we move away, those guys are going to get stopped out. So if we come back to those prices, they're probably not going to be in a hurry to short those same prices again. Now, other shorts, maybe the shorts that sat through the move up and saw the price come back down to where a lot of people entered, they're going to actually exit the market at that point. And if you're not sure whether that's really the case or you don't know if you should believe that, think about it yourself. Think about how many times you've gone short, seen the market move up, and then breathe the sigh of relief when the market came down to your entry point and you scratch a trade. Okay? And it's when people scratch those trades that actually helps fuel the move back up. Now on top of this, you're going to have people who went long in this area, who built positions at the cluster, and they're going to defend that area. So it all adds up to it being an interesting place to enter the market long if the market comes back to that spot, which is more likely because it occurred mid midway through a swing and not right at the bottom like a low of the day. Now certainly on the ES, price has a tendency to retest the top of these mid-swing clusters much more often than it will try to test a cluster at a swing low. Now here we see a lot of volume trading at the low of the day. Now even though there's a lot of volume there, we've got 7,000 contracts here, 5,000 here, 2,000, 5,000, 4,000, the delta itself is quite neutral. I mean, we've got minus 3,000, plus 1,400, plus 2,200, minus 510. So if you were watching the delta for clues as what was going on, it wouldn't really be giving you much of a clue. The delta actually starts only starts building as we move away from the low. And that's where the delta starts giving us some confirmation in terms of a bias, uh, a long bias. But otherwise, looking at the delta, you really wouldn't have a clue that exceptional volume had traded in this area. Now, it would be great, after this move up, to come back to this high volume cluster and test it again. Because we know that the, the people that went short in this area got burned and probably won't be in a hurry to short again. Now, as we move up, we can see that around this 8450 mark, we see the first mid-swing volume cluster. Now, note how the volume at all the other levels after we kind of broke the range is a lot lower. Okay, This is exceptional volume, 5,000, 6,000 here. There's nothing close to that um, as we've moved up. Now, was this somebody trying to hold the market? Um, was this somebody exiting a position? Is it uh, Statarb? Uh, orders being executed. Well, we don't know, but what we do know is that as we moved away, we built a lot of positive delta. That means we have delta confirming an upward bias. And because of this midpoint cluster, there's a chance that this area will be defended if price comes back here. Now, also on top of this, the downside on any trade leaning on this area is fairly limited. If price breaks down through that high volume, your premise is invalidated. And really, at this point in time, there is no real limit to the upside. So you have a very, very good risk reward opportunity by taking a long off the top of this volume profile, or volume cluster, sorry. And this is how it played out. We've got our initial volume cluster here. We've moved up seven ticks. And if we look at the overall move from the, the, the low of the day, up to this point is a six and a half point move. And most people who've been watching the ES for any length of time will tell you that an eight tick pullback is quite normal. So as well as, you know, with fact we've moved up seven ticks from here, um, as well as the order flu or the volume cluster being a good place to come back to, also in terms of price action, you know, we're around the area where coming back to this area would actually be a seven tick pullback, which is which is not far off what uh, an average pullback is on the ES. So as we come down, our expectation should not be that we're going to have a retest of all this volume we put in down here, but that we'll probably stop at this point. 
Now we can see that as we come down, the delta on this bar on the way down, even though actually the delta actually includes the move up and the move down, we can see the delta is about minus 2,000. So we can see that as we come back down, there's no real negative delta. There's no huge push down in delta to say this is actually you know a big counter trend uh, force coming in. And as we actually get to our spot, we actually trade at the top of this volume cluster. We can see that 1,034 contracts trade there. Now that's not really a quantity that says this is absorption. Okay. What we can actually see, if we look on the way up, we've got much larger volume on the upper side. So what we can see on the way up is that we came down to here, we traded the high of the cluster, and then buyers stepped in, and we can see that the delta goes positive, confirming that buyers came in in an overwhelming force, and we resume the move up. Now, we can see here that we created some volume on the way up, or rather we created some volume, this is actually showing us the way up and the way down. Obviously one of the problems with footprints is you don't know which volume prints on the way up or the way down. But this um, this volume here is a potential hurdle. So if you took a long of this volume cluster here, you would need to keep your eye out on this volume that printed here. Because that is a potential hurdle as we move back up. But as it turns out, we managed to get through it. Um, momentum and bias, obviously, because of the delta shift here, was on our side. Um, and reversal is the least likely scenario most of the time. So the difference between this volume cluster here and this volume cluster here, this one gives us a chance to enter a continuation trade. This one holding would actually be a reversal trade. And that's always the least likely option. Okay, now this image here shows exactly the same move, the pullback to the high volume uh, cluster created in the midpoint. Now the volume profile is probably not going to talk to you at first, but it is actually my preferred tool for reading the order flu or for trying to figure out where people are positioned. So I much prefer to see just the total than to have it split across different footprints. Now one of the key benefits is that the volume profile is very very easy to read. It tells you everything you need to know at a glance. You don't need to spend 20 minutes at it, to, you know, trying to look at what happened where. Um, it's just a, you know, literally you can look 20 seconds. You can see what's traded where, and then draw your conclusions from that. So what we have here is the DOM with a volume profile. We can see here this area is the high volume we put in at the low before we started to move up. And then we can see the volume cluster from 18, uh, 1584, 1584.50 created there. In the middle profile here, we can see that since the profile on the left, we actually came down and traded to 1584.50. Now, how do we know that? If you look at the volumes printed at 1584.25 and 1584.00, you'll see they're the same across these two profiles. Now, what's also interesting is that 85.25 is now our point of control for the day. The price with the most trades previously was 15.82 with 18,100 contracts. And now we have 24,000 contracts at 85.25. And that basically is price acceptance. That is more people willing to do business at successively higher prices. And that is very bullish. Now in the third profile, we start to get an idea of how high volume node on a long term volume profile differs from a volume cluster. In the third profile, we start to get an idea of how these high volume areas actually get created. In the middle, we've got this high volume node at 8650, and then over on the right, we can see the volume built up around that price. And the POC, again, the highest traded price, shifts up from 85.25 to 86.50. At this point, if we pop up 8 ticks and come back down, we would look for this area to hold, this high volume area here. And we would look for the top of it to hold. So we wouldn't expect to start chewing back down through to the bottom of the high volume area. We would actually expect maybe to trade a little bit 86.75 and 
and then start to move up again. Okay. Now, if it doesn't hold, if we actually do start chewing down just through a couple of prices, then the chance is very high that it's going to go to the opposite end of the range. Now, one of the things also to keep in mind that if we pop up from here, okay, and then we fall down to 86.75, any move down is going to take a lot of time. Okay, so where we have an area where a lot of volume is printed previously, the market is not just going to quickly slide down through that. So at this point in time, any trade, long trade taken here, will see you with any move upwards will be a lot faster than any move downwards. And that is also a very important aspect of the trade management because you know that a move against you is going to be much slower and actually give you time to work an exit um, and a move your way is actually going to be much more rapid and much cleaner and again it's it's not really about risk reward but it is about giving yourself time to manage the downside effectively now one thing I'll also say is entering the market you know when we've got this high volume here we could you know you know down to 85 25 really as we're in this range there's a lot of people be scalping this range on either side the worst trade you could possibly take around here is to enter in the middle because as you get into this zone you get into an area where price has basically wiggled around range of band behavior where it's very, very, very difficult to gauge the direction of the market. So if you try and enter the market in the middle of one of these areas, it's a very, very tough trade to manage because it's just going to be chopping around, chopping around, chopping around. So when you see one of these ranges, it's great to fade the high. It's great to fade the low. It's also great to see it pop up and then take a long at the high. But it's a terrible trade to actually try and buy in the middle. Okay, so I talked few minutes ago about something called price acceptance and this slide shows a typical day typical opening move on the ES um, we opened at 1582 we've obviously took a little look down to the bottom uh, we went down through yesterday's value area to the weekly value low tested that uh, market didn't want to go down any further and as it moves up people are going to see that we've rejected the area and actually start to buy and what we can see is as we move up, we build some volume. Okay. Then we move up again and we build some volume. Then we move up again and we build some volume. And this is very, very typical action in a trend day. At each of these areas where we build volume, we've got a couple of things happening. This is price acceptance. This is people, a market moving up and people saying, yes, I want to trade here. This is scalpers trading this range, but it's also areas where all those perma fades out there are trying to short the market. So basically, the market moves up and they see it slow down and they go short, and they're the people that help fuel the move up. And you can see the move up is on much lower volume, and then we range here, and the perma faders think this is it, I'm going to short, and then we move up, and then we get to here, and it starts ranging again, and the perma faders think. This is where I'm going to short, and potentially we could have another move up. So for those of you that understand volume profiles, you can wait for these areas to form. You can buy the bottom of a high volume area. You can scale some up at the top, and then you can hold for another push up. Alternatively, you can wait for the market to pop out, and then come back and retest the top of that volume cluster. Either way, what you're not doing is seeing a volume cluster and then immediately thinking the market slowed down it's therefore it's going to reverse because if you think of these more as price acceptance that the market actually likes to do business here then you'll be more inclined to stay with the overall direction of the market instead of fading it all the time one final thing about volume profiles and charts if you look at charts and long-term volume profiles, you notice that you can look at a chart and you can often figure out what the volume profile is going to look like. 
Now you can also look at the volume profile and a lot of times hazard a guess at what the chart will look like. So what's the reason to use volume profile at all? Now if we look at a chart we can take an opinion on support and resistance in terms of where price went. So at the bottom here would be support, at the top here would be resistance. Now if we look at the profile we get a slightly different view. At the bottom here we can see we have signs of absorption at the bottom of the profile because of this higher volume area. And so the profile, the volume profile, agrees with the chart. At the top, it's a slightly different story. We have a range of prices where participants traded very, very little, and a range of prices where participants traded a lot. We have this small spike up without a lot of trading. Now, it's an extreme example to illustrate a point. But it is one of the key benefits of the profile. If you're looking at this from a volume profile perspective, which prices are actually more relevant? And I would say that this step here is your relevant price and something that's really effectively hidden on the chart. So these steps in the profile are key to using the volume profile and, th and this is why volume profile has some advantages over the chart. It shows you areas that really on the chart don't look important. And that brings us to the close. Uh, we've covered a lot of material in this webinar, part one and part two, but I hope the message of liquidity consumption, floors and ceilings, helps you understand the commonality between all of the order flow tools. Um, order flow reading does require the use of discretion. It is like reading a story but it doesn't mean you don't trade without rules. It just means that every situation is different, but the overall patterns are recognizable with practice. Thank you very much.